absolutely no math in exam three. It's all theory stuff. It's over chapters five and six. Chapter five is all about chemical reactions. So it's like just a lot of theory. It's kind of like three sections that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about like why do reactions occur? Like what kind of factors affect whether reactions occur? How can you speed up reactions or change how fast they occur? Um, what are the general types of reactions? And then the ending is sort of like all about lipids. So it's going it, to, they actually did cover lipids in chapter four, but I push it back into chapter five. So when you're, if you're doing any e-text reading, you might occasionally actually have to go look at some of the chapter four stuff. I just find it's easier to put it all together instead of splitting it into two chapters. I feel like it gets a little more confusing and harder to understand. Chapter six, though, is carbohydrates. So really, this exam is over lipids, carbohydrates, and then also this whole chemical reaction kind of information. So that's why I say there's no math in here. There's no, no like significant figures rounding all of that that you have to worry about. So it's over chapters five and six. So I really think we can get through chapter five in just like two lectures. It's not a huge long chapter. It's really just a matter of trying to get through all the little details for it. So the first one is when thinking about chemical energy, chemical reactions, why reactions occur. Energy, remember, is that ability to do work. And when we talk about chemical energy, we're talking about the energy that's really contained within molecules. Right, so when thinking about like calories, the amount of calories foods contain, that is what the energy you can get out when you break bonds. So what determines whether bonds break or not? It's really the amount of energy that's either produced or used in a chemical reaction. And then we're also gonna talk about like, well, how fast do reactions occur and how can you speed that up? So the term kinetic, Reaction kinetics is really talking about rate or speed. So we're talking about this, like the energy we're really going to discuss more is the chemical energy that's found in molecules. And it's really based on a couple of things. The, whether or not a reaction occurs depends on the heat exchange that occurs. So like a reaction that gives off heat, remember like we burned the nuts last week. So in lab, we like had a nut, we lit it on fire and we just let it burn. And we burned it until it like turned into a little black ash and it just went out because there was nothing left. And you weighed it, right? So that, that exothermic reaction, exothermic reaction means that heat is given off. And so once you lit that nut, it just kept burning and burning and burning and burning. Right, So exothermic are much more favorable. If heat is released, like burning wood, lighting a marsh marshmallow on fire, they're going to just keep on burning until there's no more substance left. So exothermic is always more spontaneous or more favored, a reaction that's going to keep going compared to one you have to put heat into. Right? So it's like, last night I made meatloaf. And if I just set the meatloaf on the counter, it would not cook on its own. I have to keep it in the oven and keep adding heat to it to get it to cook. Because that's endothermic. Right? So that meant that I had to put heat in in order to get the reaction to occur that I wanted. So cooking stuff. Whereas, if you like when we burn the nuts, those are good examples burning wood because heat is like a product that's going to be a much more spontaneous or favorable kind of reaction to just keep on going so the term they use for this heat energy exchange is called enthalpy and you can remember it because there is an H in it so enthalpy is talking about heat because there's an H in the word. So H and heat, like that's actually, because there's another one called entropy, which doesn't have an H. So that's really how I kept the two of them up, like straight. Remember, enthalpy is talking about heat. And if heat is released, heat is a product. They say that the enthalpy is a negative number because it's coming out, like it's being given off. 
And this is always a more favorable reaction than if heat has to be added in. And by favorable, I mean, does the reaction just keep going? Will the reaction happen on its own? Or am I gonna have to do something in order to get it to happen? So notice when it's considered endothermic, like cooking food, that means I have to put heat in. So heat is like a reactant. So that's one. Heat coming out, that's more favorable. Heat having to go in, that's less favorable in a reaction happening on its own. The second thing, though, is the amount of order. So at my house, especially when my kids were teenagers, entropy is this like drive towards disorder. So things like go from being ordered, it's much easier for things to become less ordered, right? So I always think about like on the weekends, like you do all the laundry and you get everything straight. So then Monday school starts and by Thursday and Friday, that's when you find like socks in the living room. There's like a bowl in the bathroom. You're like, what is going on? Like everything gets disordered. That's the natural occurrence of life. Disorder is much more favored so more disorder is always more favorable. So if you can have something that creates more disorder and gives off heat, that's always going to be a reaction that happens all on its own. Taking things and putting them into order, so taking a lot of little molecules and making them bit into a single big one, that's more order. So if I have like five little things and then I only have one, that's always going to be more ordered and that's less favorable. Just like the house doesn't get clean by itself, right? The order of the house requires a lot of effort. It requires energy input. I'm going to have to do something to make that reaction occur. Just like I'm going to have to put the food in the oven, it's not going to cook on its own. I'm going to have to add things to it, add energy to it to get it to happen. So the word they use for this disorder is they call it entropy. So that one I don't have any trick for remembering. I just remember enthalpy is heat. <laughs> so entropy is order. So you could maybe remember the O in order. The more disordered, the more favorable it is. So they took these two factors. They took enthalpy, which is that delta H, and they took entropy, which they called delta S, and they put those two things together as a way to tell whether or not a reaction will happen all on its own. And that was defined by the scientist, Dr. Gibbs, and that's why they call it delta G. It's named after him. So the Gibbs free energy really just determines if a reaction will happen all on its own at certain temperatures. So like at room temperature versus at like, like 100 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Celsius. So you can change or alter the temperature. If this delta G is a negative number, then this reaction happens all on its own. So a good example would be like wood rotting. So like if you have wood out in the, just in, in the yard, so like if you have a stack of wood and you don't use it, it sits there and sits there, it's exposed to moisture, it's exposed to warm temperatures. And so over time, it just starts to fall apart. Well, that is because it becomes more disordered because it falls apart. So going from like a single piece to lots of little pieces, that is going to be going to in, increase, that's gonna create the entropy that's positive, more disorder. And that actually slowly gives off heat. So it is an exothermic process. So things that give off heat and become disordered, they're always going to be more spontaneous than something where I've got to do like building muscle, right? So laying on the couch, are you going to be able to build any muscle? No. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> but <Yeah>. no. <laughs> okay. Instead, what do you have to do? You have to build muscle. And so that's creating more complex structures. So that's going to make a delta S that's negative. So more order is not favored. And you have to put a lot of energy into doing that. You got to go to the gym. You got to work out. Okay. So you've got to put a lot of effort in. So those things are never spontaneous. So those are sort of like just 
kind of examples. And we're not going to do any calculating with them. It's really just describing these are the two things that really come into play in determining whether or not a reaction is going to happen. And I like, I kind of like their, their analogy. So they're like saying, okay, think of your, a, a positive delta G is the not spontaneous. And so it's sort of like a canoe trying to go upstream. It's not going to go upstream on its own. Instead, the only way you're going to get that to happen is you're going to have to pedal like mad, right? They require energy from the surroundings or you're going to have to add energy in to get them to happen. They are considered not spontaneous. So if that delta G is positive, this is typically because you're making more order and you're putting in heat. And this requires heat. So you see like the person here, they look like they're like trying to paddle upstream. But if your delta G is negative, that means that it becomes more disordered. And heat is released. And so that's really more like the first one where they're just sitting there floating downstream. It happens automatically. It's going to happen at the temperature that that reaction is at. Doesn't require any extra work. So whether or not that delta G really is like kind of what they use to define if something is spontaneous or a favorable reaction or not. But the best thing is to kind of think about like more disorder, that's going to be more favored. Heat given off, that's going to be more favored. So if they're both there, then that's going to be a much more spontaneous reaction than something you've got to put heat into and becomes more ordered. So when looking at like the flow of energy, why some reactions end up having like are not, they don't happen all on their own, really comes down to the amount of energy that goes in versus what comes out. And so this shows two different kinds of reactions. The first one are reactants, and we can just say, we're just use like the generic A plus B, they're gonna react in form C. So if A and B are coming together to form C, if the energy of the reactants is greater than the energy of the products, that means that you're going to get more energy out compared to what you had to put in for the reaction to occur. They call that exergonic because energy is released. The other one though, is if you have the energy of the reactants is lower than the energy of the products. So do you see that the hill that you need for each of those is different? So if you think about the, the energy that's required to go from here to here versus the energy that's required to go all the way up to there. So that first one, you don't have to put as much energy in to get over the hump and have the reaction occur. They call that the activation energy. And it is just, I kind of think of it as the little energy hill. Every reaction has an activation energy. It has a certain amount of energy that you have to put in to get the reaction to occur. So which of these two do you think is going to be more spontaneous or more favorable? The one with the littler hill, right? The one that requires less energy to get the reaction to occur. And so that's going to be these. So the exergonic reactions, this is when your delta G is a negative number. Those are always more spontaneous because I'm getting more energy out than what I've got to put in. Whereas the endergonic reaction is the one that you've got a big steep hill that you're going to have to put energy in. 
So that delta G is a positive number. So what effects or what causes activation energies to be different? So the differences between them, I didn't mean to paint the mark. The differences between them, oh really, now you're going to do that. All has to do with how reactants come together. So we said that activation energy is the amount of energy you've got to put in to make a reaction occur, and it really determines orient is, or is determined by the orientation of the reactants and collisions. So like with A and B. So if A and B are like that first graph or the first little energy chart. If they're like the first chart, then A and B can like, it doesn't take much energy. That means A and B collide easily and they may actually react in any orientation. So A and B can come together this way, this way, this way, this way. As long as they touch, the reaction occurs. That's why it has a really low activation energy. But the one on the right, some reactants have to come together exactly in a certain position. Like they won't fit together otherwise. So like A and B can only come together this way. If they come together this way, they just bounce off, nothing happens. They come together this way, nothing happens. They have to line up exactly in this like perfect condition in order for them to react. That's more like what you see with the second graph. That's going to give you a higher activation energy because it's harder to get them to come together correctly. So that can come through and create, I'm acting like this tonight, can create this can create this change and it really just depends. Some reactants need a very like specific orientation, other reactants don't. So if you had a sample of solids or liquids or gases, which do you think if you had them in the same size container, same number of molecules, which ones are gonna collide more? Solids, liquids, or gases? Well, remember, think about gas molecules in this room. Do you remember we said gas molecules like almost never touch each other? Okay, so having solids would mean that they'd all be close together. Closer proximity, they're going to collide more. Liquids can flow past each other and run into each other. Gases oftentimes are the hardest to get them to react because they're so far apart. They don't come into contact easily, so that can play a role. If something is a solid liquid or a gas, that can end up affecting that activation energy. You've got to have the right orientation, and they have to come in contact in order for a reaction to occur. So we talked about this in lab, so we're really not going to go through any of the calorie stuff. But the other thing that we can do, so we want to make sure that reactants collide, and they have to have enough energy, and they have to have the proper orientation. But we can do some things to help that happen more. So we can do the first one. So we're going to say that in this first one, the blue is going to be the large ball that's A. The little red dot, the smaller one, is going to be B. And then our final result, oh, oh, go back. The final result is going to be C. So C is where A and B have combined together. Okay, so it looks like that. Okay, so A is the blue balls, B is the red ones, and then C is where they've combined. That's the product. So if you look at this as normal. So if I start off and I put A and B together, a and B, some A and B combined, and I have like one C in that jar. I have three Bs, and I have like six, seven, one, two, three, four, seven, seven A's, okay? I have more, pro more reactants than products in the first one. So look at the second B. 
What do you notice about products compared to A? Do I have the same amount or do I have more? One more. So do you notice that I have two C's? So you can see two red with the blue. So I have more product. Right, so I have more product. So how did I make that happen? What's their little depiction? So that looks kind of like a flame. So if I added heat, so now you think, I told you that they have to come together in the right orientation and they have to collide. What do you think heat does? What does heat do to molecules? And you can kind of see what they're trying to, in their illustration, what does the heat make the molecules do? Do they look like they're moving? Okay, so they move faster. So if you have things in a container moving faster, do you think they're gonna collide more or less? They're gonna collide more. So by adding heat, I increase the movement of the molecules, and that's going to increase collisions. And if it increases collisions, it's gonna increase the reaction rate, how fast the reaction occurs. So now look at C and compare it to A. One, what do you notice about product? Yeah, there's like four of them, right? Okay, so if you look at C, do you see that I have more product? But what do you notice more of also? Compared to A, there's more A and B. Do you see that there's more A and B in C than there is in the first one? Because the first one's sort of our background, like baseline. Okay, that's just the normal. So in this, I have more product, but I have added reactant. So I put more reactant in the container does that increase their collision? Do you think they would run into each other more often if there's more of them? Yeah. All right. So more collisions because they're closer together. And that helps to speed up the rate. So notice that I have more product in that container. And then what about the last one? You see that again, I have more product. There's three products compared to A, the first one. But I have that funny little green thing. This is a catalyst. So what does it look like that catalyst is doing? How is it making more product? It's holding them together, exactly. The catalyst brings things together in the right orientation. So it takes A and B, and if they have to fit together like this, that's what the catalyst does. So the catalyst will bind A and bind B and put them together exactly the way they need to be in order to speed up the reaction. So notice there, I have more product again. Because I added a catalyst. Catalysts will lower the activation energy by putting reactants together in the right orientation. So the reaction A plus B makes C, it'll happen on its own. But we can add heat, make those molecules move faster, they run into each other more often, and that would speed up the rate. We could add just more reactants, just add more and make that rate speed up as well. But the third one actually is a little more specific because it's adding something that brings those reactants together. And that way, it's putting them together exactly. They're not just banging against each other like the heat and the and the concentration is. Instead, this is actually putting them together in the right orientation, and that lowers the activation energy. Does it say lost, lost 
Mm -hmm. Add a catalyst, which lowers the activation energy. And that really should say by, sorry, I think I was saying something else. And it does it by putting reactants together in the right orientation. So it's really not just collisions. The other two are really just making reactants bang against each other. And hopefully they hit each other in the right orientation. But enzymes can speed up reactions dramatically. Or catalysts can. That's the one we're going to talk about. So enzymes, biological systems, cells, body fluids, digestive juices, all contain enzymes. So there's estimated that there's about 20,000 different enzymes in your body. And what enzymes do is they do this. So this one, I like this little depiction or drawing because it really shows how the shape of the enzyme interacts with the reactants. So this big kind of blue circular thing is the enzyme. And the reactants fit together exactly in the right orientation. So you see the green and the yellow. So those would be kind of like your A and B. So instead of them, and that shape is pretty specific, like how they have to like fit together just right in order for the reaction to occur. But the enzyme is going to do that. So if we're looking at this reaction, what an enzyme can do is an enzyme can lower the activation energy can lower how much, how much energy is required for the reaction to occur. So this is the activation energy when you add an enzyme or a catalyst. It just lowers that hill and that's going to make the reaction much faster. In the body, enzymes can speed up chemical reactions by more than a million fold. Enzymes are actually had to evolve for living systems to be able to survive. Because if something happens, your cells have to be able to react to changes in the environment or else you wouldn't survive. Like when you go outside and it's cold. So we have evolved all of these things to help you stay warm, slow down heat loss, but you've got things like you begin to shiver. You begin to have muscle contractions. You get goosebumps. All of those things are just trying to decrease the amount of, of heat loss. But enzymes are kind of behind the scenes, speeding all of those processes up, speeding up the process of building proteins, of being able to secrete sweat quickly when you're hot so that you begin to sweat and that helps to cool you by evaporation. So there's constant changes within and outside of the body and the enzymes are really specific to help try to counter that. So I, I have my little, it, my enzyme is sort of this squiggly line because the shape of the enzyme is really important. So the enzyme has a very specific shape and its shape allows it to interact with certain reactants, which is why you have like 20,000 different enzymes because each enzyme can be very specific to a certain kind of compound element reactant shape. So in this one, I always kind of draw the, it, the enzyme looking like it's laying down E. So that shape allows A and B to fit, specifically interact with the enzyme. The enzyme then can help push A and B together. So the enzyme actually can change its shape once the reactants are attached to it, and that's gonna speed up the process. But then notice, like, if I had D and E, the shape of D and E are not necessarily the same as A and B. And this enzyme would not be able to interact with D and E because the shape doesn't match. So it's almost like a lock and key. You have certain reactants that fit together with certain enzymes. It's not like one enzyme does everything. So I have an example at the bottom, like in digestion, your saliva that gets secreted by salivary glands into the mouth there are enzymes called amylase that start digestion of starch. So if you eat a cracker or you eat a piece of bread or you eat a piece of potato, you chew and you mix that saliva with that starchy food. And it, those enzymes immediately begin to break those large carbohydrates down into smaller sugars. But if you have a piece of meat, that enzyme doesn't react, does not work on protein. So 
the piece of meat ends up having to get chewed and swallowed and has to go to the stomach because in the stomach, you have another enzyme called pepsin that gets secreted. Pepsin, in combination with hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, breaks down really big proteins into smaller and smaller chunks. So those enzymes are very specific for specific nutrients. So here's an example or a couple of examples. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are not so bad. Some of them are just kind of inconvenient. So does anybody have or know somebody that is lactose intolerant? Almost everybody does. So lactose intolerance is considered a disease and so diseases, just by definition, are when the body doesn't work the way it should. So there's some kind of imbalance that occurs. Well, in this, it is because you don't have the enzyme called lactase. Lactase has the job of taking lactose. And where do you find lactose? Milk. Mm -hmm. It's a milk sugar. So that's a sort of common name. Lactose, in order to be broken down into glucose and galactose, you need to have this enzyme. So normally, if you drink milk, there's no lactase in your saliva. It goes into your stomach. There's no lactase in your stomach. That milk actually goes all the way on into the small intestine. And this is where this enzyme is secreted by your pancreas. It's secreted into your small intestine. And that enzyme cuts this small disaccharide into single sugars. And those sugars get absorbed. So that's normal. Okay, if you make this enzyme, then you can eat, drink milk or eat cheese or anything that's a dairy product. It gets digested and then glucose and galactose are small enough for absorption. If you don't make this enzyme, lactose is too big to get absorbed. So it stays in the small intestine and it just keeps going. So it stays in the tube, not absorbed. The problem comes in when it gets into your large intestine because you have millions and millions of what that live in your large intestine? To call it your flora, what are they? Many different kinds of, what lives in your large intestine? Bacteria, millions and millions of bacterial cells that live in your large intestine and they're actually beneficial. They make vitamin B12. They also help in the absorption of vitamin K. So you still, you, you need them and they're beneficial, but when they get a hold of lactose, because it doesn't get digested, because you don't make the enzyme, they'll ferment it. And when they ferment it, they make gas. And so how does your intestines feel? People start saying that they feel really bloated. So those tubes, because it's, it's gas is produced, those tubes begin to swell. It also creates acid. Those bacteria, when they ferment lactose, they create acids as a byproduct, and that irritates the lining of the large intestine. And whenever the large intestine gets irritated, one way for it to try and get rid of it is to like flush everything. So it'll actually push water into the large intestine, and that causes everything to rush out, and that's what diarrhea is. So that's really the reason you end up with those symptoms, this diarrhea, bloating, flatulence from the gas. It feels terrible. I've had friends that have like such horrible cramps that they're like doubled over. Like they get like, like severe stomach cramps. So that's like so painful for them that they like avoid milk and any kind of dairy products like, like the plague. Like I don't want it. No. <laughs> I'm like, can you imagine? I was like, for me, because I don't have this issue, <laughs> for me, not eating cheese, that would be horrendous. Like that would be terrible because that's like, that's like a staple in my diet. It seems I'm always like, yes, we can put some cheese on that and that would be better. <laughs> they get, well, the gallbladder is one that we'll talk about when we talk about absorption of fats because that's, the gallbladder stores bile. And bile is kind of like soap. So you know if you have like grease and oil like in your, in your sink and you've been washing greasy dishes and you like add that soap to it? Have you ever seen like it makes the oil kind of like, it like separates? So what soap does is soap takes big droplets of oil and breaks them into teeny tiny pieces. And then that keeps the oil mixed with all those digestive fluids so you can absorb them. And so people that have their gallbladder out, they don't make much bile. So if they eat a lot of fat, they don't have the bile, so it doesn't mix with the fat, so the fat doesn't get absorbed, and so it ends up passing through them too fast. Can cause cramping, but a lot of time it causes diarrhea too. 
And that's just because the fat just went too quickly. It didn't get absorbed as it should have been, so you end up excreting it. And so that's, that's, a, that's a bad one. So a lot of people that end up not, if they don't have a gallbladder, they just try to like limit the amount of greasy food they eat in one sitting. So, you know, you don't have the fried chicken and the French fries and then the fried hush puppies, <laughs> the fried, fried topping on top of fried things. They try to stay away from that kind of like, kind of like only have one fried thing and then stick to things that are not quite so greasy just to avoid that. So there is, have you seen like some of the advertisements for the lactate, you know, like the milk? They're like, mm -hmm. it's regular, it's just yeah. milk. So it really is just milk. <laughs> They, it's milk that has been treated with this enzyme. That's the only difference. So they take the milk, they add this enzyme to it, it takes the lactose and breaks it into glucose and galactose. Some people say it tastes a little sweeter. Well, that's because glucose is sweeter than lactose. So it does taste a little bit sweeter for your taste buds because normally the lactose doesn't get digested till it's in your small intestine. But here you're drinking milk where it's already been broken down but the nice thing is you absorb it, okay? So you can absorb the glucose and galactose. It's just milk where the lactose has been already digested. Why is that a good thing? What is in dairy products that we don't really get otherwise? It's not just so much the lactose, but dairy products contain calcium, okay? And so for us, we're not like my dogs who love to chew on bones. Like if we have a rib bone, they're like all happy. But we don't eat bones. We don't sit around <laughs> like breaking those down. So really dairy is our primary calcium source. Especially with females, if you don't get very much dairy when you're in your 20s, 30s, and even into your 40s, that sets you up for being at risk for what? Once you get past menopause, calcium absorption slows down. So what can happen to your bones? Osteoporosis. Okay. And it's much more of an issue for females because it's so connected to estrogen. Estrogen improves calcium absorption. So once you hit 50, menopause, estrogen levels go down, calcium absorption goes down as well. And so you don't have that, men don't have that issue as bad as females do. So we are like three times higher at risk of developing osteoporosis. So people that are lactose intolerant that like completely take all dairy out of their diet, that's the problem is not the lactose issue, but the lack of calcium in the diet because of that. So having those lactose reduced types of dairy products is a bet and it's beneficial primarily just for getting the, la the calcium that you really need to make sure that your bones are nice and dense and heavy and strong before you get to menopause age. There are supplements, so you can take calcium supplements, and the supplements have improved a lot compared to what they used to be. They used to just tell you to take a Tums every day. That's not very well absorbed. Even though it is a calcium carbonate, it doesn't get absorbed very well. So most 80% of that just ends up passing through you, so you never absorb it. But there are some of the OSCALs. There are some calcium supplements that are better, more soluble calcium, so that it does get absorbed from the small intestine and then ends up helping to stimulate the bones. Because you really don't want to have to go get injections because there are, they can give you like injections of calcium. They can give you stuff to help like if they, if you do end up with osteoporosis, there's medications that they use now. So it's really important in your 20s, 30s, and 40s to try and get your normal amount calcium on a regular basis, even if you're lactose intolerant. So that one I say like, yeah, osteoporosis could end up being a really bad thing, but I always think of lactose intolerance as really being something that's kind of like, it's an inconvenience. So what about albinism though? So if you're an albino, you're missing this en enzyme. It's called tyrosinase. And what it does is it's responsible for making the pigment that is present in the skin, hair, and the irises of the eye. That pigment, melanin, what is its job? What is melanin's job? It absorbs sunlight. It absorbs ultraviolet light. Okay? So depending on the skin color that you have, if you have very dark skin, then that means you have a lot of melanin, which is good. You have a lower risk of skin cancer. If you have a lot of melanin, then you have better UV blocking. I always think of it, it's like you have natural sunblock. 
Like you ought to, it doesn't mean you can't get a sunburn though. You can still go out and get sunburn. Like don't be like, no, I don't need anything. You can still get a sunburn, but you're actually at lower risk of sunburn compared to somebody that's very fair skinned. But the, missing this enzyme, how does this person look? What does their skin look like? Very pale. Okay. Very, very pale. What about their hair? Yeah, it's blondish. And in fact, a true albino, their irises of their eyes will be what color? Mm -hmm. Red or pink. And it's because there's a lack of pigment. So that's like a true albino. I always think of like an Easter bunny. You know, like little Easter bunnies with the pink eyes. They're all completely white. They have, they are albino bunnies. Okay. But they're at really high risk of what? Nature has brown bunnies because brown bunnies have pigment and pigment helps to protect them. Their little noses are dark, not pink. But what happens to little albino bunnies? They're at high risk of developing. If you don't have melanin and you don't block sunlight, skin cancer. Mm -hmm. So same thing. People that are albinos, having this absence of, of pigment in the skin greatly increases skin cancer. So when they go outside, they wear long sleeves, pants, they wear hats, they wear glasses. A lot of times they have a lot of sun sensitivity, like it's really hard for them to see in the, when, because they don't have any of that um, pigment in the irises. Now the bottom two, so the bottom two, which is phenylketonuria and Tay-Sachs, these ones are bad. But they're, again, just missing a single enzyme. PKU, you were actually tested for at birth. So before baby goes home, they do what they call a heel stick. So they actually draw blood out of the heel of the foot. And one of the things they check for is phenylketonuria. So they call it PKU because of that P for phenyl. Keto is K and the urea is the U. They test you for this enzyme. The enzyme is called phenylalanine hydroxylase, and you don't have to memorize the name of the, any of the enzymes, but what this enzyme does is it breaks down a component in proteins called phenylalanine. If you don't have this enzyme, then you can't break that component down, and normal breast milk, normal formula has got a lot of protein in it, so that that Amino acid is really what it is. Phenylalanine doesn't get broken down and it begins to build up, but in high levels, it's toxic. So what happens is if you have a baby with PKU, that means they don't have this enzyme. If they start off being breastfed or normal formula, when you first bring them in, like at birth, normal baby, normal activity, normal reflexes, you come back for that six weeks checkup, everything's good. But when they come in for their three month checkups, you're starting to see a reduction in reflexes. Baby is not hitting those landmarks, so they're not doing the head turning. They're not like grasping as well as what you should see a three month old, and it gets progressively worse and worse and worse. So after seeing that, like seeing babies, uh-oh, they're starting to develop these symptoms, they actually finally worked it out. What are we missing? We're actually missing this enzyme. It's just a single enzyme. But eventually, what ends up happening is it starts causing permanent neurological deficits. So the baby will never develop normal brain function, normal logical reasoning. So it's sort of like they end up staying in that three-month-old stage for the rest of their life. <clears throat> Once they figured out it was this enzyme, they said, well, let's just put them on a diet without phenylalanine. If we put them on a diet low in this component of proteins, then there's not much there anyways. And you found that they would develop just fine. And once they get to that normal age, it's not as much development. So, you know, like by the time you're two years old, you have like your head's 80% its size. That's why you have those big headed two-year-olds. You know, like, like they look kind of odd it's because her head goes. <laughs> I have a little grandson who's four months old. Sometimes he's like this. He's like, <laughs> my daughter's like, look, his head's so heavy. He can't even hold it up sometimes. <laughs> his head looks like it's like this big compared to the rest of his body. It's so cute. But that's like so hysterical to me. Mm -hmm. I know, like you're so cute. <laughs> you look ridiculous. <laughs> but that's once they reach like into childhood, then if they have a little more phenylalanine, if they have a little more of this protein type, 
it's not development. Once you reach this kind of maturity neurologically, then you don't see that issue. It's really during childhood that you have to restrict this one specific component that's found in proteins. So kids that have PKU are fine. In fact, if you ever have a Diet Coke, not regular Coke, but Diet Coke, which has um, aspartame in it, aspartame actually contains phenylalanine. And so if you look on a regular Diet Coke can, it'll say, warning, phyto, phyto, um, phenylketonuria, and then it says contains phenylalanine. And it's just the sweetener, because that's what your um, NutraSweet contains phenylalanine is one of them. So it's just a warning so that like, if you have a little kid you don't want to give that has PKU, you don't want to give them that to drink because that's going to be a source of phenylalanine. So you just try to limit it. So it's one that doesn't have to be an issue, but they didn't really understand it. They had to kind of work out what is it? What is missing? What's not right? What, what's happening and what's creating this issue? Tay-Sachs on the other hand is one that's an inherited disease so it's passed from parents to their offspring, and it's this missing, it's hex, hexose aminidase A. It's a very specific enzyme that's used in generating energy. So baby is born, but by the time you see four weeks, eight weeks, three months, four months, you start to see a decline, and there's really nothing that you can do, unfortunately. It eventually, babies with Tay-Sachs typically only live 18 months to three years old, so starts off because of this lack of this enzyme, you, you cannot make energy for proper neurological development. So mental retardation starts, then baby loses sight, then you start to see muscles stop working, and eventually you have respiratory arrest. So, and that's just one enzyme, like there's 20,000 enzymes. Missing some enzymes, you end up being an out one enzyme, you get an albino, or you end up with lactose intolerance. Those ones, like you can still live a normal life, but there are some that are very significant. In fact, it's estimated that more than half of the miscarriages that happen are because you were missing an enzyme. There was an enzyme that blocked normal development of that fetus, embryo to fetus, and that's why they didn't go to full term. So they probably would have never survived any longer so that like they got to two months or they got to six months, they got to some age and then they ended up declining because the body wasn't able to speed up chemical reactions, specific chemical reactions enough for normal function. So those are just some examples of them. So now that's kind of the, the, the intro part, like, why do reactions happen? What are some of the factors that affect whether reactions happen? And then how can you speed up reactions by heating it, adding more reactants, or even by adding a catalyst? This middle part is talking all about, well, can we put reactions into like a, a generic type? So yes, we can say that reactions are either gonna be synthesis. Synthesis reactions are when you're doing buildup. Okay, we're taking two things and making just one. So A and B making C, like in our example, that's a synthesis reaction. And the way you can always identify synthesis, there will be more reactants than products. So I might have two reactants in one product. I could have 10 reactants in three products. The, the rule though, is if I have more reactants and fewer products, it's always going to be a synthesis. So I could have like A plus B plus C plus D making E and F, that's still synthesis, okay? So it doesn't matter how many, it's that I have more reactants than products. Can you see that this would make more order? Right, taking a lot of little things and making bigger things, like building reactions, synthesis, building reactions. Most of the time, these don't happen spontaneously that these you have to put some energy in. So like building muscle. But decomposition is kind of the opposite. So decomposition is when you have more product than reactant. And again, it doesn't matter how many on each side, the kicker is you'll always have more product. So I might have two reactants, eight products, or I might have one reactant, three products. So in either way, if I have more products than I have reactants, that's a decomposition. And whenever I think of decomposition, I just think about things like decomposing, like falling apart, right? So if stuff decomposes, it goes into smaller pieces, it doesn't stay whole anymore. 
And these reactions are often sources of energy. If you can take something big and make lots of little pieces to it, that's a decomposition reaction. These are always more favorable, right? Because they are always more disordered and they give off energy. So now the other one is actually two kinds. So they call it an exchange, but it's really two examples, exchange reactions. Sometimes they just call them displacements. Exchange reactions are when you're swapping partners. So notice in this, do you see that there's two reactants and two products? Synthesis, I have more reactants and products. Decomposition, more products and reactants. But you notice here I have two and two. So I have A, B, and C, and then I have C, B, and A. So there's two. If you see that they're equal, if the number of reactants and products are equal, then it's going to be an exchange reaction. I can tell the difference between a single displacement and a double displacement by the type of reactants and products I have. So in single displacement, I have a reactant, I have a compound and an element. And do you see that I have, they call it a single displacement, because I'm really like swapping a single pair. So I have a pair and a single, and then I end up just swapping one pair. So one pair splits and combines with the other one. So that's a single displacement. So you're looking for an element and a compound, making a different element and a compound combination. But double displacement, this is if you have two compounds and they both swap their partners. So in this one, do you see that A and C are going to swap places and B and D are swapping places? So A joins with D, B joins with C to form new compounds. So good rule, two compounds making two different compounds, that's a double. It's like the wife swap show, <laughs> right? So in that you have like two couples and they swap wives for a while and then they realize how much they like their first wife. And they're like, <laughs> I really appreciate you now because <laughs> she was terrible. That's like 90% of the time. That's what the family say. And it's crazy because the other family says the same thing. Like, I don't know if you've ever watched it. Huh? Even Allison and children. Yeah. Like, even though this, this wife was, like, super chaotic and this one was super rigid when they swapped, the families didn't like it when they went back. They were like, we prefer our chaos or we prefer organization. <laughs> like, they're so used to it that they can't stand it otherwise. But that's kind of what this is. Double displacement is sort of like couple swapping. Okay? Now, what's also interesting is almost always these are salts. These are ionic compounds, like NaCl. So if we had two compounds, the... A and C are typically metals. B and D are those non-metals. And so what they do is when they swap, they end up still, notice that A is still out front when it joins with D. C is out front. It was with D, now it's with B, but it stays out front. So an example in this one, like if you take an acid in a base, because we'll talk about this one in neutralization, the outside partners end up connected. The inside partners end up connected. So Na combines with which part? This one, find it in there, Cl. So we make what? NaCl, we make salt. And then the H combines with, mm -hmm, which is what? OH. So H and OH make what? H and OH. H2O. So HCl is hydrochloric acid. Sodium hydroxide, NaOH, is a base. This is why they say if you take an acid in a base, they neutralize each other because what they make is a salt and water. So it's, but if you look kind of like following how they combine, that's where that comes from. So we'll look at some of these ones here. So what is this first one? So this is just based on these four. It's synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, or double displacement. No. It's synthesis. 
okay? So remember the arrow is the divider. So do you see that I have two reactants, one product? This is synthesis. The only way it can be a single or double replacement is if I have equal numbers on both sides, okay? So what about the second one? Yes, this is the double displacement. So first thing to do, count the reactants in the products. If you have equal numbers of reactants and products, then you know it's a displacement. If I have more reactants than products, it's synthesis. If I have more products than reactants, it's decomposition. But remember that that's sort of the split. So this would be considered double displacement. What about this one? Al2CO33 forms Al2O3 and CO2. What is this one? Decomposition. So remember, synthesis, I always have more reactants. Decomposition, I'm always going to have more product. And that's, when, that's without even balancing them. We're just looking at the numbers specifically. So what about this one? How many reactants? Two, and then how many products? Two. Do you see that there's two of each? So Fe3O4, that's a reactant. H2, that's a reactant. I have two reactants. And then Fe, that's a product. And H2O, two products as well. So I know it's a displacement. Sweet. Thanks. Got it. So I know that it's a displacement. So then you've got to figure out, is it single or double? Mm -hmm. It's single because it's an element and a compound. So this one is a double displacement, or sorry, it's a single displacement. What about the next one? It's a synthesis. Mm -hmm. So this one is a synthesis. Two reactants, one product. the next one. Hmm? Cl2 plus H2O makes HCl and O2. So I have two reactants and two products, so I know it's got to be a displacement. Do you see that? So here's my arrow. So I have equal I have two reactants and two products. It's a single mm -hmm, because it's an element in a compound making a different element in a compound. So you see how these two are the same? Elements in a compound swapping one partner, single displacement. What about the next one? Synthesis. Synthesis, because I have two reactants and only one product. CaO plus HCl makes CaCl2 and H2O. That's a double. Because mm -hmm. two, two compounds making two different compounds. Okay? So if you have two in the, in, ahead of the arrow, two behind the arrow, you know it's a displacement since they're both compounds. I know that that's a double displacement. And then the last one synthesis. More reactants than products. Okay, so practice this one. We'll do this one next time. Just know that sometimes a reaction, I notice all of these with the arrow goes one direction, like the arrow just goes from left to right, left to right. But just know that there are examples of reactions that are what they call reversible. A reversible reaction means, like if I have A and B combining, that this, A plus B, can form AB. So that would be a synthesis. But under other conditions, they can break down. So that would be like a decomposition, right? Where I'd have that splitting back into their individual parts. So if you see this arrow 
or if you see an arrow that looks like this, it will look like two half arrows that are going in opposite direction. Just know that that's talking about a reversible reaction. So I can have the reaction go this way or I can have the reaction go that way. So either of those, when you see arrows looking like they're going both directions or a half arrow one direction or the other direction, then just remember that that means like I can have this reversing. So it's not just from reactant to product. I can reform reactant. And we will talk about equilibrium when we get into acids and bases. So the last thing, so the last thing I want to talk about tonight, and then we'll quit, is there really is a fifth kind of reaction. So if you look at this one, do you see, it looks like a displacement, right? Can you see that I have two reactants and two products? CH4 plus O2 makes CO2 and H2O. So I have two things on the left, two things on the right. But on the left, I have an element and a compound, or compound and an element. And on the right, I have two compounds. So do you see how this one doesn't fit a single displacement? that it doesn't really fit a double displacement either. This is a combustion reaction, and it's actually very specifically defined. Combustion reactions happen when you have some kind of carbon molecule reacting with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. So this is the only part of a combustion reaction that changes, is the kind of carbon molecule. It might be methane, remember that CH4? It could be ethane which is the next one down. It could be propane, it could be butane, right? It could be cyclohexane. It could be any kind of carbon containing atom or a molecule, but the part that stays the same is this. Plus oxygen makes CO2 and water. This is the part that is how you defined a complete combustion. It always has this. The only part that it varies is what kind of fuel you're talking about. What kind of carbon containing molecule? Like I could put gasoline plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. I could put peanut oil plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water, right? When we burned the nuts last week, okay? That was a combustion reaction. Remember that's really exothermic. So we could actually put over here heat, <laughs> right? They give off a lot of heat when these, when fuels burn. They call this a complete combustion because it completely combines the carbon and the hydrogen with oxygen. So you end up making carbon dioxide, which is a gas, and water, which ends up being like a vapor. So it ends up being a gas as well. We use engines. This is how you heat your home. Like this is the most common form of energy production, any kind of fuel. Complete combustion completely combines carbon with oxygen, hydrogen with oxygen. But there are examples, if there's not enough oxygen, so if I have a fuel and I don't have as much oxygen as that fuel needs, I can still break down the fuel, but instead of making carbon dioxide, I can make C, which is, would be just what? Just carbon. Mm -hmm. And carbon is black. So your fireplace or around your fire pit, what happens, the discoloration all over it ends up forming this kind of like black sooty stuff, right? So even your grill, like we have like one of those Weber grills and the whole underside of the Weber grill, is like, it's all this black stuff. You just try not to get it on you because it's kind of like the nut lab last week where once you got it on you, then it got all over your papers, it got all over the lab bench, got it on your face, like the whole nine yards, same thing. So carbon is produced. Carbon, unfortunately, creates this soot that begins to cling to surfaces. So carbon is the solid. And it builds up. When we used to build, when we used to burn coal, 
and we used to burn wood as a primary energy source for heating a home, you would get a lot more carbon produced. You can tell there's carbon being produced if you see a yellow flame when you light something, like a candle, okay? So if you have a candle and you put it a little too close to the wall, sometimes it'll get like some black soot on the paint. That's why, it's because that, that candle wick burns with incomplete combustion and some of that wick ends up forming carbon and it'll stick to the paint. It's a bigger issue though, is if you don't clean your chimney and you are using really high fuel sources that make a lot of carbon, it sticks to the walls of the chimney and eventually you can build up so much, it's almost like having charcoal briquettes lining your chimney. So then when you light your fire and your fire is blazing, what happens to the carbon on the walls? They actually ignite just like a charcoal briquette. And so see that image? So that picture over on the right shows a chimney fire. That is where somebody has allowed a lot of carbon to build up in the walls of the chimney. And then those bricks get so hot, they will ignite the roof. And this is how you end up burning the house down kind of thing. Okay. So people that use their, their chimney a lot, they need to have them service and they literally come in and it looks like a big bristle brush. It's a great big bristle brush and they put it down the chimney and like literally knock and scrape all of that carbon off to clean it. So they used to have people called chimney sweeps. That was a job. Like that's all you did. You just went around and cleaned chimneys all day long. And those people were always black. So they used to tease them about like being this little chimney sweep. So they would just have these big, huge brushes on really long sticks and they would just stick them down and clean the, clean the chimneys because they were burning wood or coal as a fuel source. Methane, propane, that burns a lot cleaner. We don't make near as much carbon soot, so it's not as big of an issue, but it can be if you're using wood or if you're using coal. The second reaction, the second reaction shows if you don't have enough oxygen, the carbon doesn't form just, or the um, fuel doesn't form carbon, but it can make CO. So you remember what that means. What is that called? Instead of carbon dioxide, this is carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide, it is an odorless, colorless gas. So you can't smell it. You don't see it. However, when you inhale it, it, gets, it moves from the lungs into the blood, just like oxygen does. So oxygen diffuses into the blood. Well, so does carbon monoxide. But carbon monoxide actually binds to the red blood cells and it blocks oxygen from binding. So over time, your oxygen levels go down. If you have low oxygen levels, you're gonna start to feel tired you're going to start to feel less alert. People describe it saying, feeling like they just get really weak. They fall asleep, then they lose consciousness. And if it becomes too high, then you are literally suffocate. So the carbon monoxide can actually replace the oxygen in your blood. And without oxygen, you can't make energy and your cells cannot continue to function. So how this often happens is when people have an old furnace that they haven't had serviced and so there's a leak so the exhaust from the furnace instead of going out of the house small amounts of the exhaust fumes are leaking into the house and part of those fumes are typically carbon monoxide it's not a large amount in fact usually it's very very only like if you're burning this fuel it might only be like one percent of the burning is creating carbon monoxide but when you inhale carbon monoxide, you don't exhale it. When you inhale it, it binds to the red blood cells and stays there. So normally you would just exhale carbon dioxide, but you don't exhale carbon monoxide. And that's why this takes hours. You don't just die like in a minute or two. This actually takes hours in order to build up. And people are like, oh, I don't know. I don't think that happens very much. So I always like to look. So I don't know if you remember in July, there were three Marines that were found at a gas station. Like they had gotten tired and they pulled over. The car was running because they were still trying to run air conditioning. And they were found dead in the car. And they were like, did they try to kill themselves? No, their car had an exhaust leak. 
And so some of the exhaust from their engine was going into inside of the car with carbon monoxide. So they were tired. It happened at night. They stopped at a rest stop. They left the car running so that it didn't get so hot in the car because you know what it's like in July. Okay. This happened in North Carolina at a gas station. So they stopped to take a break. And over the course of the time the car was running, I'm sure somebody put an alarm on their phone and said, we'll get up in two hours. So the carbon monoxide was leaking into the interior of the car. Carbon monoxide levels went up. They got tired. They got weaker. They passed out. They lost consciousness. Eventually, the car ran out of gas. And here, somebody comes up. Why are these three guys in this car? Oh, my God, they're all dead. That's why. It's because of carbon monoxide. So, I mean, I remember hearing about this. This was just this past summer, a couple months ago. They found an American couple was found dead in a Mexican hotel room. And they finally worked out, like, there's been a lot of challenges with some of those Mexican hotel rooms. <laughs> it, like, some of those resorts. Have you heard, like, over the last five, ten years, like, people just dying? So-and-so was found dead. I'm like, hmm, maybe we shouldn't be going to those Mexican resorts anymore. It's a little sketchy. <laughs> like, but that was the same thing. So they were at this resort, the heating, the furnace wasn't like vented properly. So small amounts of carbon dioxide seeped into the hotel room while they're sleeping and then they're found dead the next morning. So it, what happens is it's just, it doesn't have, if you walked into a room with a lot of carbon monoxide, you'd be like, <coughs> you'd choke and you would leave. Like you would notice if your oxygen drop levels dropped fast, this happens over hours. So the carbon monoxide levels go up and your oxygen levels go down, but it doesn't happen instantly. And that's why people just pass out. That's why they don't like know that they have them. So there's another one. That one was in Omaha. I was just looking up and down through Google because there's plenty of them. A lot of them are in China too. I was like, hmm. <laughs> there's one carbon monoxide danger. A mother, pregnant mother and two sons were camping out in Kansas. Mm-hmm. So anytime you're using any kind of fuel, like methane or propane or anything that's not like electric, if you're using any kind of fuel source and burning, you have to make sure that it's vented, which means that you've got to be able to have those exhaust fumes vented to the outside of any kind of compartment, house, camper, tent, anything like that, because there's always a risk that a small amount of carbon monoxide is being produced and that can end up having deadly effects over a period of time. Okay, so I'm going to quit there because it's like time anyways. So I'm going to quit there and we will pick up. We've got to talk about oxidation and reduction, which is a good one to start as a new thing. We'll start that on Wednesday. Everybody knows like it's fall break, Monday, Tuesday, no, no classes. But then we'll pick up and hopefully get through the majority of this chapter on Wednesday. Mm-hmm.